Yeah, the Elzik riots was kicking off at the time, so it was like cars getting burnt out, people rioting every night. It was like friction between the different communities in the area, so everyone was just rioting. The young ones were just running wild, the parents didn't have no control on them. The parents were all getting pissed, fighting in the streets, sig being surrounded by violence and just seeing it every day, every night. When I was 15, I, that's when I started uh, going out drinking in the clubs and that's when I was fighting all the time every weekend and it became, well, I was used to end up using bottles. Mm. So that's when the weapons started coming in because we're always carrying knives, knuckle dusters. Some lad, when I was on my way out, said fucking, you know, but a fucking mug. So I've turned round and just went bang, just knocked him clean out. But instead of just leaving them, I've dived on top of them with two bottles and just started smashing them to pieces. Because oh. at the time, like I see from a young age, I wanted to go to prison and I wasn't, I wasn't really asked about jail. You'll get off with this, we'll win the case. There's no, this evidence isn't strong enough. And then five minutes later, I'm hit with IPP, which is like a life sentence. That fantasy in me head wanting to go to prison. And then when my dad was locked up, I wanted to be in there with me dad and I'm now in there in the worst prison possible, I'm fucking loving it. <laughs> I remember it was uh, Darren Barrett. He was serving 40 years. Life with a recommendation of 40. He was the head of Al-Qaeda in the UK. He was in the kitchen. And so I looked over and I seen a big pan of oil just bubbling away. And he was standing washing his dishes. And some lad just come in, picked the oil up and went up behind him and just tipped it over his head. And this is all the things in my head instead of lying, fantasizing about prison, fantasizing about violence. I'm now fantasizing about my freedom, about being out there living life. Behind the bars, ruthless fitness. Finally, <laughs> it has arrived. The podcast. We've had lots of people requesting. And if you've not read this book, it is so inspirational. And you're going to hear more of the details of the backstory that led to this and the YouTube channel and what Ricky has been through. And, you know, just, just reading the early part of it, I was so moved by his journey of addiction and getting in trouble with the law and even alcohol and smoking and everything else. And then he just decided I'm going to stop it all and to have the mental strength to do that but when you give things up if they are negative addictions it leaves a hole inside you and you've got to put something in its place and in this case it is fitness workout programs because when you change the physical it changes the mental and Ricky is just a fucking class example of someone who's gone through it gone through the darkness and emerged at, at the right age to get back on the fucking right track. His YouTube channel, I highly recommend it. Link is in the description box below the video. Please go down and, and sub and, and check out what he's doing now. No, it's, it's, it's really good stuff. And all of his other links will be in the description box below this video as well. So please, you know, support what he's doing. And he's been on Paul Stansby. Shout out to Paul as well. We love Paul recently. He's also been on 23 and 1 Lockdown, Josh. Shout out to Josh as well. We've been watching you for years. All right, so huge thank you for coming on. Yeah, Ricky. huge thank you. Oh, thank you for getting us on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's start then with how it was for you growing up. Growing up, we, um, I grew up over here. and Well, I was born over here in Newcastle. I lived here for five years, but the area that I lived in, Elzik, it was uh, really rough at the time. Yeah, the Elzik riots was kicking off at the time, so it was like cars getting burnt out, people rioting every night. Was there a reason there was riots? I think the reason behind it was a group of youths had been in the chip shop and they'd done something, they upset the owner, and the owners uh, were foreigners, I can't remember where they were from, and they'd getting some fat oil out of the cooker and tipped it over one of the youngsters, so it just caused... It was like friction between the different communities in the area, so everyone was just rioting. Yeah, and my mum and dad decided they wanted to get us out of there. 
think they were giving us a better life, so we moved over to Stanley, County Durham. And the street that we moved into, Cleveland, was another... wasn't rides going on, but it was another... I wouldn't say a shithole, but it was a rough area. Were there gangs? Not so much gangs, but everyone was just... The young ones were just running wild. The parents didn't have no control on them. The parents were all getting pissed, fighting in the street. So uh, the young ones were just doing what they want. So you were five, did you say, when you went there? I was five when I went there. So how was that registering to you at five then? Can you remember? I can't really remember the move. I remember from the age around about six when I got over there. But my family was from over that area as well. So that's why we moved back over there. And growing up around there, I think it was mostly as soon as I'd get in there, to be honest, getting into trouble, going over the fields, lighting fires, just going out shoplifting and just being surrounded by violence and just seeing it every day, every night. What did that do for you, like shoplifting? Was it the thrill of it? Yeah, it was. It was a thrill of it because obviously we didn't really have much growing up either. So we're going into the shops and we're just taking what we wanted, really, just to get a bit extra money, pension and, sweets and that. I mean, did you have any siblings? I've got a, uh, another brother and sister that lived with us, and I've got another three older siblings to my dad's first marriage. So there was three of us. Like, I was the youngest out of all of them. And you were the naughty one. <laughs> you couldn't see that. <laughs> were you a thrill-seeker, then, at such a young age? I suppose, looking back, I must have been high, because, yeah, I was, like I see, I was always out getting into trouble and loving it, and I always looked up to the wrong type of people, the people that were getting into trouble. And my next door neighbour, he was a few years older than me, and he was into trouble all the time, and he got put into, a, like, a boarding school, and he'd be coming back and telling us that he'd been out on days out, like, getting took out and getting treated, sort of thing, so I was looking at it like you're getting rewarded for it, and that's, like, the road I was going down, you know what I mean? And what age were you then? Seven. Yeah, you got into that a bit was- of trouble at school. When I was when I was seven year old, that was the first time I got locked up. Was, yeah, me and this CM lad I was on about, we're going into this shop. Yeah, it was called Winners. I don't know if you remember it, <laughs> old high street shop. Yeah, and so we're going in and we're pinching bottles of aftershave and perfume because we're going to go around and sell them, <laughs> get the money for us. <laughs> so we've been in in and out of the shop four times, getting pinching the cassette tapes as well. I remember the movies that were on the cassettes, <laughs> VHS. So uh, on the fifth time going back in, because we're coming in and out and just filling a box up around the back of the shop, and then on the fifth time coming out, the security guard just grabbed us, <laughs> took us in the back room, called the police, and I got locked up, seven-year-old. But yeah, uh, w- was it one of them where like they try and scare you straight? The police. The took us at the police station. I was just like, wasn't even asked, wasn't fierce. <laughs> Did your parents come down? My dad came and got us. Yeah, um, because my dad didn't really ever used to proper tell us off. He just used to give us advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, he took us back to my nana's. My nana kicked us up the arse. He went off it. <laughs> Little old nana. <laughs> oh, bless her. When, when they got you for that one, were you fearful of about them calling your parents? Like I say, I didn't, wasn't fears about it. Even at that age, I wasn't bothered. Because, yeah... Uh, from that age, from the age of seven as well, that's when I found out my dad had spent a lot of time in jail when he was younger. From the age of 12 up until he was 27, he'd spent about 14 years in jail. How did you find that out? Just off stories he used to tell us. He um, used to tell me next door neighbour and that, and we used to be like in awe listening to the stories. Do you, me- do you remember any yeah. of them? I remember he used to tell us the stories. Um, he told us this one story where he was in prison, had the, it was the old metal trays. They were going down in the line for surgery, and there was a lad a bit bigger than him. He used to try and bully him. He said, so he thought to sell this one day, oh, I'm going to get him when he comes past. And he's got the metal tree and just smashed it off his nose and smashed him all over. And he, my dad was just telling us these stories that he was doing all the time. He used to smash the screws all over, do the screws in. And he used to charge him with a mattress back in the day because they didn't have shields and inject him with a liquid cosh. <laughs> so mainly fighting? Fighting, no, just Charges, violence. Yeah. So I'm listening to these stories from that age, and I'm like, oh, I want to be like that. I want to go to prison. <laughs> from the age of seven, I'm like, I want to go to jail, you know what I mean? But definitely. <laughs> and you got arrested quite soon afterwards. <clears throat> at I that did, young yeah. age as well. When I was 10 year old, yeah, my headmaster, because I was always fighting in the school as well, in junior school, fighting in the yard with the other kids, and the headmaster was like, if he found out you were fighting, he would drag you through the school. 
buy your hair, smashing you off all the walls. Like, proper violent, but he was this big bloke, six foot four, big rugby player. Yeah, Couldn't I mean, get away this... with that these days. <laughs> What's that, sir? Couldn't get away with it no, these days. No, no, no. no. Um, he sent us outside of his office one day for fighting, and he come down, I mean, standing by myself, and he comes booling down the corridor by his cell, just launched us off the door, and I've smashed off against the door. And when I've been in the house, getting changed there the next day, big bruise down my back. And obviously my mum and that had seen it and says, what the hell's fucking gone on here? Tell them it was the teacher, yeah, the head teacher. Um, and then that weekend, me and my friend went down to the school, just smashed every single winner in the school. Smashed his office up and everything. We were even trying to set fire to it. But that was rebelling against what he'd done to us, you know what I mean? Was this with so, bricks? Bricks, I. But we went down on the Saturday and the Sunday just to finish the rest of them off. What? <laughs> <laughs> Like the ones that hadn't been smashed were all taking shots. Like he was getting the most points for smashing that window. <laughs> but then on the last one, all we heard was a car door slam. And we looked down, we're seeing the police car. Yeah, come after us. So we've just took off across the fields, getting away. And then the next day, the key I'm looking for us, um, got pulled in, got locked up. Yeah, but because of our age, only 10 year old, couldn't do nothing. Well, they course. had to release you. Hard to release us, but obviously when I went in, even from that age, I was just seeing no comment. <laughs> and so when they came in, they were just like, they didn't know what to say. They brought me mother in, obviously my mum was in the interview with us. And they, uh, they just said, there's nothing we can do, like because of the rage. But he's not allowed back in the school, he's excluded from school for permanently. So, uh, so where did you go from there? I didn't go anywhere until I went, I was due to go into the big school, like the secondary school, about a month or two afterwards, so... Uh, I just stayed at home until... Did you get homeschooled? No, not. No? Just no. went out doing other things during the day. What's <laughs> what was you, I, well, I think this ties into this question. <laughs> what was your first involvement with uh, drugs and alcohol? Yeah, my first involvement with uh, drugs was seven-year-old. It was around about that time. There was a street, uh, a shed just along from where I lived, where all the local blokes used to get in, smoking the weed, but it was tack back then, the wood. And there were... Um, I walked into the shed and seen them all. And one of them just offered us the joint and says, oh, do you want to, do you want to kind of that? So a seven-year-old had a couple of blows of it. Did you know what it was? <laughs> Didn't even know what it was, no. No. That calmed me down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't remember what really happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was when I got to the secondary school when I was about 11. Yeah, and we were drinking alcohol mainly on weekends. Then we started experimenting with weed. But we used to chip in about five of us, a pound each, get a five a deal. <laughs> it used to last us all dear. So did you focus on any subjects while you were at secondary school? I was actually quite good when I was in school. The teachers always used to say, like, I'm wasting myself because I was good at English and maths and everything. But I just never used to listen. No. Yeah, and like I say, the alcohol and drug use was just becoming nearly every day. Like going into the school, we even smoked it in the school. 11, 12 year old, all the young ones just... Going out at dinner time and instead of going to the chip, you would be in the bush or something with uh, <laughs> the buckets. <laughs> How old were you when you started to get big? <clears throat> wasn't until I was about 18 when I shot up. Because I, um, I started smoking when I was seven as well. I was smoking all the time and That's I young. was quite small. I was, my nickname when I was younger was Little Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't guess that now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, when I was seven year old as well, that was the first time I'd used a, uh, a weapon. I was thinking I was about seven, eight year old. Yeah, um, I was on the back of my bike, uh, my brother's bike, sorry, getting a batter along the street. And some lad had jumped out from behind the car, grabbed my brother in a headlock, and he had him in a headlock, and he was just going beat with red, wouldn't let go. And I picked the metal pump off the bike and just started smashing his head in with it. <laughs> he let me shot, let go. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you were going to the clubs getting in fights at age 15. When I was 15, I, that's when I started uh, going out drinking in the clubs and that's when I was fighting all the time every weekend. And Was it just random fights with piss heads or was there gang rivalries and drugs? It was a bit of both. Um, most of it was just random piss heads. Like if you're out or people from out the area or if I went into a different area because you didn't recognise each other. Like I never ever used to go out looking for trouble but it always used to seem to find us. But I always used to end up finishing us. <laughs> <laughs> Because obviously, because I started when I was getting to 18 and that, because I was getting bigger. I wouldn't say I was like much of a fighter, but I was a one-punch knockout. Most of the time, I just used to hit people once and that was it. And were there any arrests at this point? 
I was arrested about five times for numerous different violent things um, over them years, but nothing ever come of it. I always got NFA, had no further action. Where was the place to go in Newcastle back then? Was it is it the West End, was it called? Something called the West End? Well, see, I'm from County Durham, so I didn't really come over. Oh, you were in County Durham, that's right. County. Yeah, yeah, I just used yeah. to go into Stanley. Okay. But it's like two villages, sort of villages. You've got like Stanley and Concert. Just like Witness so, versus Warrington, that <laughs> kind of thing, is it? So if the concert lads come down to Stanley, which wasn't very often, then there'd be hell on. Or if we went up to concert, you would always end up fighting. Yeah. But then... It'd be well. I was used to end up using bottles, mm. so that's when the weapons started coming in because we we're always carrying knives, knuckle dusters. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed to be the norm at the time. To be honest, everyone was. And this was some for a few sort years. of weapon. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> that's <what> I <laughs> did, did you get injured from from that? Yeah, um, period of time. I'd never been injured with a weapon, but I'd been obviously in the scraps. I'd been hit a couple of times and. There was a time when I went over to, uh, we were in Magaluf when I was 18, even when we went over there. I think it was England v Wales at the time. It was the <laughs> World Cup or something like that. And I'm sure they were in the final or something. And we were in BCM Square. Um, and there was like all the Welsh lads were on one side, we were on the other. And it was just going off it. <laughs> um, and we went running up to them, but I've turned round and there was only me and one of the bloke. The rest of them had ran away. So I just thought, fuck it, I just fucking ran into about 50 of them, just started banging them. And the next thing I know, I'm fucking lying on my back, we opened up and I've looked up and fucking, there's about 10 lads on top of us, I thought, fuck. I'd get knocked clean out and I was lying on the floor. Well, luckily they didn't kick us when I was down. Didn't they? That was good. <laughs> so something else happened around the age of 18? Yeah, um, when I was 18, I mean, dad got uh, lifed off a murder. And that was, obviously I was already gone down that wrong path. And then once that happened, my head was just totally what? fucking mashed. What was the circumstances around that? <clears throat> yeah, he murdered his partner in a domestic. Bloody hell. And obviously that like affected us big time, you know what I mean? So I was drinking even more. And then the violence was just happening even more, fighting even more. And then I remember I was at a house party um, and I got locked up. Well, before I got locked up, sorry, I am. Um, we're in the house party, and uh, some lad, when I was on my way out, said, Fucking, you know, but a fucking mug. So I've turned round and just went bang, just knocked him clean out. But instead of just leaving him, I've dived on top of him with two bottles and just started smashing him to pieces. Oh. So, and, where uh, were you when you came about the information of your dad being arrested for murder? At the time, I was actually at work because I was working at a job in a factory, and uh, the they come and got us and said, you need to go home. And when I'd walked through, the, um, my sister was there and she tell us. What was your reaction? I just broke down, fucking crying. Fucking devastated. Wow. And did they tell you at that point what he was fa- what sentence he was facing? No, it wasn't until they, um, obviously he'd been on remand and all that, I had to go through all the procedure. And then I think it was about six months later, he got uh, lifed off. So when you get lifed off in this country, then does that mean you get parole after like 25 years or something? You're eligible or... It depends. Everyone gets different tariffs. Yeah, mm. and his tariff was yeah, 12. Mm. So he had to serve like 12 years. Yeah. And what year What year did he go in then? Yeah, um, oh, I can't remember exactly what year it was. I was 18 at the time, so I can't remember off the top of my head. So is he out now then? He's out now, I... Yeah. Did you, um, like, when the court, all that stuff was going on, did, were you involved in that, going to court and stuff? Or? I didn't go to court. Obviously, I was going to see my dad when he was on remand and stuff. He, um, obviously, he pled guilty, so it wasn't, it was just like a sentence and hearing. Was he clo- were you close with his stepfather? I wasn't close, but obviously I knew her. Yeah. But he, um, I went to school with our son, actually. Yeah, um, so obviously seeing him was hard, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. What about going to visit your dad in prison as a young person? When I was going in to visit my dad, um, it was mostly on a weekends, and obviously I'd been out still drinking and using drugs. But at the time, it was just like recreational drugs. I was taking these on a weekend, coke and stuff. Yeah, and I was going in to see my dad, and like, I'd just be sitting on the visit, telling him what I'd been up to, what I'd been doing, who I'd been fighting with, what I'd done. 
And he was trying to see it. it was like, look, are you going to end up in here if you didn't sort yourself out? But he uh, obviously got, didn't listen to it. <laughs> no. But you did get your own GBH um, beef. Yeah. Well, that one that I'd done at the house party, um, the police had been looking for us. My mum rang us up and said, the police are here, you know what I mean, looking for you. Yeah, um, and my friend who, I was, who was with us at the time, he actually jumped in with a bottle as well and hit the lad, so there was two of us. Both with bottles? Both with bottles, aye. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the police were looking for both of us at the time. But my mate had already been to prison for a stabbing. So I'd said to my guys, look, I says, I'll go to the, I'm going to go to the police station, I'll take it on my toes. I'll admit it, I'll say it was me. Because at the time, like I say, from a young age, I wanted to go to prison. And I wasn't, I wasn't really asked about jail. Obviously, I'd hear a lot of stories. And in my mind, I wanted to go to prison. I wanted to experience it from that young age, you know what I mean? Obviously, I think that's why I was doing everything leading up to that. Um, and I went to the police station. I remember it was 12 o'clock at night. And the police station was shut. But there obviously, there was police still in there. And I'm banging on the front of the fucking police station like a lunatic. <laughs> and I'm just shouting through to see him, what do you want? And I'm like, you fucking, I'm wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Take so, <laughs> so they took us in round the back. They said, come round the back. So I walked round into the backyard of the police station, went in. And he uh, just stand talking to the copper. <laughs> and he says, fucking, how are you? And I said, oh, fucking Ricky, I'm wanted. So he's rang through. He says, ah, oh, you're all howling. <laughs> <laughs> so I took us in. Got locked up, they took us up to concert police station. That was like the main police station at the time. And uh, I'd been in there and I went in the interview room, I just admitted to it. And then I said to my hands, I fucking, I was seeing them lock us up, I want to go into prison. And then in the morning, they come through and they said, right, you're getting out. So they took us into the sergeant's room. I was getting processed, he's saying, uh, we're releasing you on bail. What? And I looked at my guns. <laughs> are you fucking serious? I said, I'm telling you. I want to go to jail, you know what I mean? It's not going <laughs> to, this isn't going to end, this is just starting, you know what I mean? And they still just let us out. So you're released on bail? So I got released on bail. Waiting your court get date. Waiting yeah. for me court case and all that. Um, I went up and I pleaded guilty. Um, and I had to go back for sentencing. So two weeks before I was due to get sentenced, I committed another violent offence. And what was that? That was another... Section 18, JBH, but this time it was with a machete. What was that over? The lad who I'd done it to, he'd been in my sister's house. My sister would have never had a friend round, and it was a friend's boyfriend. But I'd already warned my sister, she says, don't let him in your house. He's a fucking smackhead. He takes volume and all, he's unpredictable. So I get a phone call five o'clock in the morning, because I just lived along the street from my sister. And I was sitting in the house with a few of my mates, were still sitting there off our heads, partying. Um, and she rings us up, crying her eyes out, saying, oh, fucking, I've been done in. Fucking, the lad just done us in. So I've just jumped up, fucking, always had weapons in the house, grabbed a machete. I went running down the street, but the fucking police car was outside my sister's, so I've ran back in the house. And then it was two weeks later, I was with my friend, and he'd rang up, griefing down the phone, and I've just fucking flipped. I says, do you realise how you're fucking talking now? What I'm going to do to you? So I just hung up, and within five minutes, I was at his door, rang me other mate, arranged a lift, got some balaclavas, um, and I had the masks on, put the balaclavas on, and just fucking booted his back door, and the door just flew off, landed in the kitchen. And I've just ran in with the machetes, and he's fucking lying there, uh, sitting on the set. He put his arm up, and I've just fucking started chopping him. Chopped his arm, and his arm was hanging off, and I'm just fucking going to sit with the machete. It was hanging off? <laughs> oh, shit. And was that an ex-partner of hers? No, that was, so was my friend, my sister's friend's boyfriend. So he was he was sweating her, was he then? Oh, sweating he, both of them. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. He rang up and he's giving grief doing the phone. He's giving me sister grief and I just fucking flipped. Not just sick. fucking Yeah. Um, obviously fucking went sick on him. And then What stopped you uh macheting him? What made you stop? My friend actually grabbed us and fucking said, Oh, he's had enough and we ran out. How many times did you say you hit him? I think he had about yet chops. And like you said, his arm was nearly hanging off. His arm was hanging off. It was in a bad way. Like. Did it get sewn back on, do you know? I've got the... Obviously, when you get locked up, you get the paperwork through and all that, and obviously you had some bad scars off the attack. 
So as you're leaving that scene then, were you were you feeling like you, in the moment you were justified because this guy was like you being brutal to these That's you know what your left. sister and a mate yeah. mm. and he had this coming uh, as you're leaving the scene is that what was going through your head it was I was like obviously sort of at the time justifying it to myself thinking he deserved it he shouldn't have fucking hit me sister yeah um, and obviously when I'm running when we took off we ran away jumped back in the car the adrenaline going and just. I mean, when you're young, you think of nothing better than revenge, so... Right. Yeah. And when you saw the arm hanging off, did you think there could be more serious consequences because of that level of violence? Again, because of the mindset I was in, I just wasn't asked. I just fucking... Didn't think of the repercussions. Didn't think of the repercussions, and they, um, obviously the police were looking for us again. And they, um, I think it was about... So I'd been on my tours for about a week, just stopping at my mirror, just sleeping on the set or not. And it was a week before my 21st birthday... Was sitting in the bar, and I got to 12 o'clock at night, I'm sitting thinking all these thoughts in my head about going to prison and that. And because of, from that young age, I always wanted to experience prison. My mates had been in the wires, the young offenders, and it was a week before my 21st birthday. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going to harm myself in so I can go there first. So uh, I've went, walked to the police station 12 o'clock at night, same police station, <laughs> same <laughs> time, I'm banging on the window. And the looks up and they're like, see, what do you want? <laughs> and I'm going, I'm wanting it. <laughs> they went, you again. <laughs> <laughs> so same sort of thing, got took round the back, took up the concert police station, got interviewed and all that, and I said, yeah, uh, said no comment. Um, obviously, I didn't admit her at that time. And then got took to the magistrates in the morning and they got remanded. Obviously, I knew I wasn't getting out this time, committing an offence whilst on bail, you know what I mean? Earlier you said then there was parts of prison that, you know, you wanted to go to prison because there must have been certain things you were fantasising about in prison. Like, was what, what were those things? It was just <clears throat> fantasising about being in there, meeting different people. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> obviously getting into yeah. fights and that still, just thinking... In over prison? <laughs> so making a rap in prison was, <laughs> was something that was important to you? Did you think these are the baddest of the bad guys and you wanted to be in the mix? I, that's what it was. It was like growing up, you want to be the fucking biggest and the baddest in the area, wanting that reputation. Yeah, um, and that's what I was doing. You know, that's what I was, that's the way I was thinking at the time. So you didn't see it as a youth club or something? <laughs> that's what it was like when I got there. <laughs> really? So like, there's usually like big names people hear about. I know like when we go down to Middlesbrough, it's like Lee Duffy, Viv Graham, that kind of thing was the big names you'd heard about as a young person? Not particular, not like round my area, because obviously because of where I lived over in County Durham, it wasn't like being in Newcastle where you hear of the names and all that. So it was just people in my area really that had been to prison and all that, and I looked up to them and wanted to do what they'd done basically. But yeah, obviously I got remanded, and then I was on my way to Cassington, Young Offenders, Obviously, Cassington had a bit of a name as being like a, a rough jail for young'uns. Take us through day one there. Uh... Well, I was on my way there in the paddy wagon, um, and I remember they had Galaxy Radio on, and I'm oh. just sitting in the back pop and away thinking, <laughs> I'm on my way now. <laughs> <laughs> Is Galaxy yeah. even still going? No, it's capital no, Capital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. So uh, on the way there, they stopped off at Newcastle Court, and they picked a couple of lads up there. Another lad who was there, he was a first-timer, but you could just tell he was like proper sheepish. And then there was this other young in there, about a couple year or two younger, who you could just tell had been to jail, been in and out, and he was just like looking for trouble, you know what I mean? So when we've, we've landed there in reception, there's the three of us in the room, he's just sitting there all cocky, weighing us up and all that, because obviously he has been in before, and we both said, no, I mean this other lad. So he's thinking, I fucking easy pickings these. So uh, I'm looking at him thinking, you're fucking getting it, you little cunt. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other lad's sitting there like shitting his cell. You could tell he was like a typical first timer, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, and then he got processed first, this lad that had been in before. And as he was going through, he looked back at us like that and gave us this cocky look. And I'm looking at him thinking, you fucking, <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen to you. <laughs> So we're getting onto the wing and uh, I walk past him and he put his foot out trying to trip us up and I've just fucking jumped up and went sick and said, get in the fucking showers, I'll fucking do you. And he's just keep, no, I don't want any trouble, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, 
It was like him trying to test us, you know what I mean? But I was, obviously I was prepared for that because I'd heard stories and I knew what was coming. <laughs> so. You were sizing up the biggest guy. <laughs> yeah. They're looking at me, but I'm also looking at them thinking I'm ready for you, you know what I mean? <laughs> where, where did you end up housed? Cassington. Cassington. No, I mean like in a cell, in a dorm or? Yeah, um, it was all like different house blocks. Dorm, um, obviously it was all single cells. Single cells. And I remember uh, the first night, I was standing in the middle of my cell, just like in a day's looking at the telly or not. And I seen the, heard the flap go. And I've turned around, obviously it was a screw coming around checking on us. And I look back at him like that, and he's like, uh, I was like, all right, mate. And he's like, I'm not your fucking mate. And slammed the flap, and I thought, <laughs> that was like my first interaction <laughs> with the screw, and I thought, you fucking cunt. So what did it look like <laughs> in your cell? Just a little metal bed, a um, wooden cabinet, and that was it. A TV? Yeah, a little TV, I. Yeah. Sink toilet, or? Had your toilet. It was a metal one, metal toilet, metal sink. Yeah. Um, and you're just in there by yourself. But again, I just wasn't even feared. I was like, I was ready for it. Did you sleep all right the first night then? I think I slept all right, I. <laughs> <laughs> what about in the day room? Did they have anything? Yeah, well, the next day when I went down for went down to surgery where they served the food, as I was walking through, oh, Ricky, really, how are you doing, pal? <laughs> <laughs> One of my mates from Stanley. So he was giving us plenty of food and all that, and he's fucking, he got us a job straight away on the cleaners. Yeah, so I'm out my pad during the day and all that, obviously mopping the landings and sweeping because they were saying, I would just do out to get out of your pad, you know what I mean? Otherwise, you're banged up all day long. Were well, people asking you to pass things? Obviously, we're passing bits of rollies and all that under the door and backwards and forwards, all right. And how did you spend your day when you were in your cell? Yeah, fucking writing letters. Just writing back to people at back at home, watching the telly. Exercise? Yeah, I was good. one of my mates would give us a good bit of advice, he says, but when you get to jail, he was like, it was my mate's dad, he was there 20 years older than us, being a prisoner or not. He said, every opportunity, get to the gym. And I remember him saying that, so that's what I've done. I just got to the gym at every opportunity. What equipment did they have in the gym there? It was just like an ordinary gym. You go in, you've got your barbells, you've got your uh, um, bikes, treadmills, so you can do cardio, you can do weights. It was kitted out. There were decent little gyms. I've got to ask, is a guard present when you go to the gym because of all the equipment being quite heavy and can be used as a weapon? There is. It's different. In the jails, you've got like normal screws on the wings and then you've got what you call gym screws. The gym screws wear like a blue uniform. They, um, so you've got maybe two or three of them in the gym with you, obviously in case anything kicks off. I was going to say... So, how long did you serve on this one? Well, um, I was in Cassington for about two months. Um, and I got transferred down to Durham, HMP Durham, because obviously I was 21 at this point. And I went down to Durham for a, like a preliminary hearing sort of thing. This is like adult prison now. <clears throat> adult prison, I. Um, and they were actually going to send us back to Cassington. And I stood up, I said, listen, I said, I'm 21, just send us to Durham. <laughs> so you were was, excited about going? Well, I'd, I'd done what I wanted to do up there. It was full of just fucking idiots, just young, daft kids. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to be him with the bloke, so... So had you, had you risen to the top of that one, then? More or less, I am. Um, so you needed a, new, needed a new challenge. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, everyone up there that I was getting into altercations with, because of my size, when I was fighting, I was just... See him again, just one punch, not out, nothing... Was there quite a few acts of violence up in... Um, in Carson, no, I yeah. had about, it was about three or four different times. I. What were they? The, um, the first lad that I had an altercation with, the second one actually, um, who I'd knocked out of, would been having a game of pool. But at this point, I'd been there for two weeks. And the tension and the atmosphere, and it was like people wearing up and seeing who's, who's who. So I've come out this day knowing that like something's going to happen. And this kid's giving us grief about the fucking game of pool. It was just, just over a half game of pool. And I've went for him. The screw shot over. He shouts, Colleen, wait till you're going back to your pad. So he's more or less saying, like, people's watching you just wait till you're going back to your cell. <laughs> so at the end of source, when the buzzer goes, everyone's walking back. Me and him's walking back to our pads and side by side. And I've just looked at him and just went, crack, just hard as I could. All my force put it in. And he's just fucking splattered on the floor. 
But he's just dived, he's actually dived straight back up and just started chucking windmills and we've just both getting stuck into each other. <laughs> the screws have come running up, ripped us apart, fucking took us there, got put down the block. End up getting, I think it was 14 days behind the door, no no association, no TV, like 10 minutes for a shower. How did you survive that? I was reading Nuts magazines. <laughs> <laughs> One way to do it. You said, you, you said you knew something was going to happen that day. What was the... Like you could just feel it. I could just feel it building up inside of us. I knew like people were testing us, and some people wanting a reaction. And I just thought something inside of us just thought this is fucking. It's going to happen in here. Like, and I remember it was a Friday afternoon when we went down on it. Yeah. So you were in there for two weeks. That was after two weeks. I was in there for two months altogether. Yeah. So. What was the next fight you had in there? The next one was yeah. Someone had pinched. Backy on me pad, tobacco. Um, because those cleaners had opened up, our cells are left unlocked. But all the cleaners were all trusted each other and it was only us that was open, so we wouldn't go on each other's pads. But um, I went back to me pad to make a roll-up. My backy was gone, my skins, even my lighter had been took. Nothing worse than so a jailhouse thief. I flew down into the social room and I have went into there. There's a room about the size of this where all the, all the kitchen lads, uh, um, the cleaners are in there. I think we're playing on the computer. So I ran in, I says, which one of you have took me fucking back? You know, I'm shouting at them and they're like saying, well, fucking hell, it was none of us. So I've looked outside and there's this lad who had been opened up and he was standing talking to the chaplain. And I've just fucking went up to him and I said, fucking, you've took me back. And he's like, oh, I haven't. And I said, I'd see it down his side of his pants. So I've just fucking smashed him in front of the priest and knocked the fucker <laughs> up on the floor, got me backy back. <laughs> <laughs> all the screws come running over saying what the fuck you're doing doing that in front of the chaplain <laughs> I just says where he's took me fucking back yeah, I need to fucking took a back of him <laughs> was that your last fight I got moved on to a different wing then obviously because of that yeah um, got put behind me door again and then that was I think well, that was the last one that's when I got moved down to Durham right so walking into Durham walking into Durham I remember getting off the bus and just looking up, and a big old Victorian prison, and it's just the total different feel to it. It was just like fucking horrible, like looking at it. Did it start like, to feel real then? You knew you were in prison then, like when you looked up, you thought, oh, fucking hell, this is a, a proper jail, this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, got put up into reception, got processed, and all that. Um, met a few people. In the waiting room when I was waiting to go in, talking to a couple of lads. I feel a lot older than you. They were more somewhere older than us, I. Yeah. Majority of them in there, they'd been in and out numerous times. Yeah. Um, I remember getting put on the wing, but this is in there, it was all double pads. So I got put in with somebody else. <clears throat> he was actually quite a decent lad. I um, got on all right with him, had a good laugh and that. Because obviously, when you're in jail, even though you're in a bad situation in prison, you can still, you still have a bit of a laugh, you know what I mean? Dark sense of humour and that. <laughs> but um, I'd been in there for about, I think it was four months. Um, Single cell again? No. It was, what happened was I got kept getting different pod mates all the time and I was fucking sick of it. Any the, one you didn't get on with? I got on with most of them, but they, they put us in with this... Um, I can't, he was from Africa, I think he was Nigerian or somebody, couldn't speak English. So I'm sitting in the pad and I'm like trying to talk to him, and he's just sitting there. And then he's, when I'm trying to have a conversation with him, he's sitting writing stuff down, all that. I was sitting. So when he's went out to work, I fucking went in his drawer, pick it up, and he's like writing in English what we'd been talking about. And I thought, <laughs> you're going on as if you can't speak fucking English. And I just thought, yeah, fuck this. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Was that how he was trying to learn by writing down the conversation? I don't know what he was doing. Was he putting you in his book? <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> at the time, I was actually being seen by the CPN, the community psychiatric nurse, because um, I started experiencing mental health problems. And at the time, I was obviously I was 21, and I was having these feelings I didn't couldn't understand what it was. I was having like extreme feelings here it was like uncontrollable and that. when I was out on social stuff yeah I mean I went and seen the doctors and they were telling us it was anxiety and I think that was caused through the drugs that I'd used when I was younger smoking weed from a young age and stuff 
Yeah, and when I was I was seeing the CPM once a week, and when I went up and seen them, I sort of made a bit of a story because I knew if I'd said this to them, they would put us in a single pad. So I said to them, he says, how are you feeling? I says, I'm all right. I says, but when I'm in my pad on the night time and my pad mate's standing watching the telly, I says, I feel like I want to do something to him. I says, I just keep getting these violent thoughts and all that. And he's, he's quizzing us and all that. And then the next morning, about six screws opened the door and just said to him, out. <laughs> he needs a single cell. <laughs> so obviously they wouldn't put anybody in with us after that. Did you do that on purpose? I'd done it on purpose because I knew that they would have to do that, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> otherwise, if you see it to the screws, I need a single pad, they just laugh at you, oh, fuck off, we're not giving you a single pad. Because everybody wants a single pad, and you kind of get it. So I knew how to get wronged. it. Did, any, did anyone try and take advantage of you because you were young and they were all older? No, they didn't really. Obviously, I was a big lad as well. And in the jails, there is a lot of bullying going on, but it, it tends to happen to people that they know that can do it you know what I mean? So someone that you can tell can have a bit of a fight and they're not bothered about, they tend to leave you alone. So I didn't really get much. And you're still on remand at this point? <clears throat> still on remand at this point, yeah. Um, but obviously when I was having these feelings of anxiety and stuff, when I was out on source, it was starting to lead to like paranoia and that as well. When I would be looking at people, and they're looking back at us and I'm having these overwhelming feelings. But I, I, I felt as if they could see what was happening to us. And then I'm starting to like feel all funny and that. And then I've kept, if I look back and they're still looking at us, I'll be like, fucking shouting them, what the fuck are you looking at? And they're like, but it was just me making the situation worse with me own feelings and that. Not instead it, of, sorry, uh, was it because you didn't know what you were facing? I think it must have been that as well. I am um, obviously waiting to go up and I, I was getting telt that I was going to get IPP. Um, and obviously I didn't really understand what it was. And uh, I went for, I took it to trial, my case, because I had the balaclava on. The only evidence they had against us was my voice. They, they said they recognised my voice through voice recognition. Um, and that was the only evidence. But I actually got found guilty. And then five minutes later, I got sentenced. So I went into court thinking that, because my barrister kept saying, oh, you'll get off with this, we'll win the case. There's no, this evidence isn't strong enough. And then five minutes later, I'm hit with IPP, which is like a life sentence. And I was like, fucking hell. On my way back to Durham with IPP, yeah. And when you get a, outside of your pad, you've got like a, a little card with your sentence on. And mine had on 99 years. Jesus. <laughs> Oh, and how did you feel then? Your dreams of going to prison from a young age? Oh, like you see, now when you see, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I didn't want that. <laughs> Fucking hell. So you said you got me on voice recordings? No, it was voice recognition. Like the took, obviously, the lad, the victim who I attacked, him and his girlfriend said they, they recognised my voice. Surely that's not enough evidence. Well, that's why my barrister kept saying I was going to get not guilty, but yeah. obviously the... They took their word for it, not say how I got convicted. So in the aftermath of getting the 99 years on your, on that notification then, what was going through your head? Again, I didn't, at the time, I just took it on the chin, I thought, because I got a recommendation of four year, um, which I pay, pay for the viewers that don't know. Obviously, you've got to do a recommendation and you get certain things that you've got to do, courses and all that. But in prison, like, when you come across new people, you're talking to people, they're all saying, like, oh, what are you in for? What's your sentence and all that? And when I was saying, oh, I'm IPP. And the reaction was like, fucking hell, IPP. You're going to be in for about 10, 15 years. And I was just like, that was making me anxiety worse. I'm thinking, I was more like, in my head, I was saying to them, fucking shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear this. You know what I mean? I'm thinking four years, I'll be out in four years. But then I'm getting till 10 years, 15 years. But there is actually lads in there now. The sentence came out 17 years ago. And there's lads that are still stuck in there now after 17 years yeah, of a two-year tariff. That's the deal with the IPP, isn't it? Um, yeah. You don't quite know when you're going out. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. Know what that sound means? It's more sales being racked up on Shopify. What do you think of Shopify, Jen? I absolutely love Shopify. The all-in-one 
e-commerce platform to sell, grow and make money for your business. Have you used it to boost your business? 100%, yeah. (laughs) So Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell from anywhere in the world. From creating your online shop in your own look. To finding new customers to scaling your burning idea. You can do it all from one place. With no need for skills in design or coding. It's how every minute of every day, a new seller makes their first sale with Shopify and you can join them. So what is your favourite UK-based business that's found success with Shopify? It's got to be Gymshark. They have grown massively thanks to Shopify. Now it's your turn to start selling today with Shopify for free. And thanks to 24-7 support, Shopify is there to help you every step of the way. Sign up for a free 14-day trial at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean right now to grow your business today. So that's shopify.co.uk forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. So yeah, you were spent, obviously you got sent back to Durham. Durham, yeah. And what's, how was that? I was in Durham for another two months. Um, and they ask you what prison you want to go to. Like, you'll get a choice. You've got, like, three choices. And obviously, they were saying you've got to go to a life for prison because, and I was caught B because of um, the offence and obviously the violence and all that. Um, so I wanted to go to Franklin because it was in Durham and that's where I'm from. But Franklin was there, the Mac- high security prison. And, um, and I remember I kept saying to the screws are, when am I going to Franklin? And my mates on the association room, I was playing pool with them. They were like stopped in the tracks and like, what, you want to go to Franklin? <laughs> I was like, wait, aye. This is you fucking crazy, you. <laughs> so uh, I got transferred over to Franklin. Um, I was still 21 at the time. And obviously Franklin's got the worst of the worst. People doing 40 year tariffs and stuff. But um, when I got to Franklin, I actually got put on the same wing as me dad. No what? way! <laughs> By like just chance. There was there was only two wings at the time. The rest of them were non swings, and you've got like F and G. Um. So when I've landed there, the I don't know if they were waiting for us getting there because one of the screws had said to me, "Dad, on the morning, have you got a brother or something?" And he said, "No, I've got a son." And he says, "Oh, he's on his way. He's coming on oh, the wing." Oh shit! So I've landed on the wing, and my dad was at work, but the lads that were out on the cleaners. Obviously, they had a heads up and they're all shouting down, are you Ricky? <laughs> Obviously, aye. He says, oh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to Franklin. <laughs> it's always yeah. good, like, when you land someone, you know someone, isn't it? But let alone your dad. But your dad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I remember walking down the middle of the wing and all the cleaners were out. All right, lad, they're all waiting for us, you know what I mean? They followed us in the pad, says, oh, we've got a hi-fi here for you, we've got this for you, we've got that for you. And I was like, fucking hell, sweet. <laughs> your life was made. <laughs> So what, what was it like actually seeing your dad in there for the first time? It was like fucking being reunited now and you fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Did you hug? Did I give him a hug and that and yeah. Another thing, like obviously that fantasy in my head wanting to go to prison. And then when my dad was locked up, I wanted to be in there with me dad. And I'm now in there in the worst prison possible. I'm fucking loving it. <laughs> Were you kicking it with him in the daytime and stuff? No, I was having it with him. There was about six of us that uh, all had it with each other. Because obviously in there you've got your own clicks and you've got what's called a food board. Because um, in there you can cook your own food. So there were six of us on the food board. I think it was five or six of us. We'd all take turns of cooking the food on a night time, cooking big meals and that. Um, like I say, everyone all had their own different groups, clicks, that... We're in the rear, cooking different food and that. I mean, not that you needed it, but did you feel protected having your father there? Sort of, I, but like the lads that I got in with straight away, they were like, because I was younger and I was like, because of the way I was, they were like, looked, no, what's the word? Like, because of the way I was, they were like fucking looking at us, thinking he's fucking cracking him, but he's a good kid, you know what I mean? We'll make, we'll make sure he's all right. <laughs> and was your dad well respected obviously in there he got on with everyone everyone liked me dad I because mm. yeah he just got on with his time and yeah. he was well liked how did you pass the time when you were hanging out with your dad and his mates we'd just be in the pods um, sitting in my mate's pod he was out on the cleaners and most of us would go to his cell the cells are quite big 
and we'd just be sitting in there and everyone would just be cracking on. I'm just be sitting there. I remember some days I'm sitting listening to armed robbers talking about security vans that they'd robbed and banks that they've done and I'm just sitting there thinking, fuck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to watch the films about stuff like this. <laughs> now I'm sitting here living it. Any famous high profile people in the There was loads, I ah, yeah, um the ones I'd name was um Colin Gunn. He was probably the, the biggest name in there. What was he in the for? He was in for a double murder. He was from Nottingham. He, um he was in there his crew was called the Bestwood Cartel. Don't know if you heard of him. Yeah, heard of Colin Gunn. Oh, yeah. He, he, um, he was well respected, big bloke. He's actually, I think he's been in 18 years now and he's still on high risk. Wow. Like high risk is in there, you've got like cat here and then you've got category A high risk, which is the ones that are like, I think the like category A high risk, they've got the fucking like the banana suit on. Or is that the exceptional high risk? Oh no, that was a sk- escape risk. Yeah, um, He got put in that once. And that was through uh, that David Bieber, the American cop killer. Mm. He was in there. Um, I remember training in the gym one day and he was training next to us and I had a bit of a conversation with him. I remember looking at him and his fucking eyes were just black like shark eyes. He was just gone. He looked like an absolute fucking psychopath. You know, when you look and you think, fucking, there's just nothing there. Mm. Was he the scariest one you came across? I wouldn't say as scariest, but he was... One of the craziest. <laughs> yeah. Obviously because of what he'd done as well. Yeah, and when he killed that copper on Boxing Day. Wow. The copper was on his hands and knees, like, pleading, and he fucking still shot him. Cold blood. Cold blood, all right. Yeah. So being high max security, was there many violent acts in there? Or were they were quite well behaved? Because they were there all facing such high. long sentences. There wasn't loads, but the ones that did happen was, like, really fucking naughty and serious. This first bit of violence I seen was actually the second day I was there. Um, I was in the kitchen. My mate took us in, cooking some steak. It's like a bit of a welcome meal. Um, and there was a terrorist in the kitchen, him and his friend. I remember it was uh, Darren Barrett. He was serving 40 years. Life with a recommendation of 40. He was the head of Al-Qaeda in the UK. He was in the kitchen. And I looked over and I seen a big pan of oil just bubbling away. And he was standing washing his dishes and some lad just come in, picked the oil up and went up behind him and just tipped it over his head. Yeah. And I just seen all his hair and his skin and that just peeling away and dripping down the back of his oh. neck. And I was like, maybe we had looked at each other and we said, fucking hell, let's get out of the kitchen. So we walked out of the kitchen and this, uh, the terrorist, he's actually still went after the lad, went in the pad and had a bit of a scuffle with him. Oh. Oh. But he... Um, the tension on the wing after that was fucking unbearable because what happens in the high security prisons, because it doesn't care that he's a terrorist, because he's like a Muslim, all the Muslim lads are all stick together and they're a big force in the in the dispersal systems. If one of them comes for you, the whole lot come, they're like they stick together. So they are like they're a fucking force to be reckoned with in there. Mm. So but was like the, the tension step? on the wing... Because some of these lads, the, the Muslim lads, big, big lads as well. And they're walking around and you're thinking, fucking, like, the tension on the wing. How many just, people were on the wing? I think it was, yeah, it was either 100 or 120. I think that, it was 100. So how was it divided, like, racially? How do you mean? Like, like how many Muslims, do you think, approximately? Um, I think there wasn't loads. Um, at the time, I think there was between 10 and 20. Mm. And then the rest was just like white people, white lads. But like some of our other guests have said, because they stick together, then they've got this solid crew, yeah. haven't they? Versus the rest are all kind of divided, aren't yeah. they? Or independent. Because they stick together, the white lads didn't really stick together. A lot of them didn't. They just wanted to get on with the sentence. They didn't want to get involved. But you also had the issue if they got involved and they got sent to a high security prison down south, it's the opposite. It's 20 white lads and 80 Muslim lads on the wing. And then you're fucked if you land down there. And that's why a lot of them didn't. So I remember a couple of lads that got sent from front and they'd been fighting with the screws. And they'd had trouble with the Muslims. And one of them, the screws thought, right, you bastard, we're going to fuck you up here. So they sent him down to Long Lawton, knowing fine well, 
that he was going to land on the wing with all the Muslims. And within five minutes, they've come in his pad, pool balls in the sock, knocked him clean out and stabbed him to pieces. And he woke up in hospital. I was going to say, did he die? And they they they'd done that on purpose because they knew. What was the retribution for the guy who got jugged? About a few weeks after that, there was another uh, another terrorist on the wing. He's come out of the kitchen and went up to this lad, some Geordie lad. Uh, he was just sitting, eating his dinner with another three lads. And he's he's come out with a pan of hot oil. And he's just went up behind the Geordie lad and just tipped mm. it on his head. And it went over his head and his fucking head just blew up like a balloon. What? And he just sitting eating his dinner had nothing to do with it. And the, the Muslim lad, the terrorist, done it just to get off the wing because he thought he was next. Oh. So he done that and he ran down to the exit, more or less said to the screws, take us down the block. And they took him off the wing. He was never seen. Do you know why the Muslim lads were getting jugged in the first place? What started this whole thing? That w- The one in the kitchen, the first one, was because he was a terrorist. Ah, and the second and obviously the lads, some of the lads up here, the white lads, obviously they didn't agree with that. Obviously they were thinking, why is he walking around the wing and nothing's yeah. happened to him? So obviously they done that to him. But they knew there would then be a blowback by the and whole Muslim gang. And the body, um, there was a twice where it went off properly between the the whites and the Muslims. It happened on F wing, and it happened on G wing. There was screws getting laid out. There was people lying on the pool tables. Could you could you fucking, could you describe how that built up? The tension just kept building up and building up, and because of what had been happening, a lot of the the black lads and the Muslims they didn't want to be there. They wanted to be down south, back down there, and obviously you wouldn't want to be all the way up here, would you? When you're, you're from down there, so they thought if they're getting the fights, they've got no option but to send them back down there. They've got nothing to lose, some of them, because they're doing thirty year tariffs, forty years. You know what I mean? So. You, what are you going to do? Give them more time. Mm. So the tension was building up. Just building up and you could feel it was going to explode and one day it just fucking kicked off and everyone was running around the wing fucking bashing each other. All sorts happening, people getting stabbed. Screws, like I say, screws were getting done in. And then the same happened on G-Wing because it followed over onto their wing. They thought it's time for them to do something so it fucking kicked off and yeah, um, there was a bloke in there Warren Slaney, I think he laid about three or four people out. He's from down Leicester Shadow, I don't know if you heard of him. He's a uh, well known in the high security prisons, hard bastard. And I think he laid about three or four of them out. When it <laughs> pops off like that, are people like got things over the faces so the cameras can't see what they're doing or are they just running wild? They're just running wild. So they've got towels round the necks, wrapped round the neck so you kinda of get stabbed in the neck. <laughs> I mean how does a right like that end? The screws come running on from, obviously, there's four or five wings down the bottom. When the alarms go off, all the screws come running on. And, like, fucking... Because the whole wing's not fighting, it's only, like, say, 20 on to 20. When the screws come running on, there's fucking about 30 of them. Obviously, they've got fucking batons and... Do they spray? Uh, I don't think they had a spray at the time. Um, But, obviously, it just sort of fizzled out. And then the whole jail got put on lockdown where we weren't allowed out at all. We were, allowed, we were getting unlocked one at a time to go around to the servery to get your tea, uh, get your dinner or whatever. And you had 10 screws following you around. And I think that went on for a fucking four or five days. And the um, the team came, and I can't remember the name of them, the, um, the drugs team come in and raided every single pad, looking for weapons, looking for everything. Taking everyone, taking oil off them, taking butter so people can't turn it into ghee. And uh, did they ship people out as well during the <clears> four people or five were getting days? Shipped out, aye. They really thought they were troublemakers. And then uh, there was one lad left on the wing who'd been involved with this riot, one black lad. And he's went round for dinner and he's just fucking leapt over the counter and fucking attacked one of the lads just so he could get moved because he thought, fuck, I'm left by myself now. But yeah, the lad that he jumped over, I think it was uh, I think it was Willie Moore. He was serving the food up. He's uh, another big gangster from Liverpool. I was going to say the Scouser. Oh, he's, yeah. He's, uh, Darren G's mentioned him a couple of times. So don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, so he's no joke. So they jumped on it. He so jumped. they've jumped over the, just to fucking, just to get off the wing. 
And obviously the screws have grabbed him, took him off. And then he, uh, the tension on the wing after that was just like, fucking mad. Did it pop off again then? It sort of calmed down because a lot of the white lads and the black lads were all put down the block, the ones that were fighting. Um, and then what they were doing, they were shipping them out and shipping other people in. And like fucking changing the dynamics of the jail. And it did sort of calm back doing everyone got back to doing the normal thing and not feeling on edge. So, <laughs> so, so have you fantasizing then about getting to the high security prisons <laughs> and, 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 and seeing juggings and all this stuff going on around you? Were you rethinking that at this point? I was just like that, looking around, thinking, fucking hell, just in awe still, thinking, fucking oh, still in awe. <laughs> still in awe. Is your dad still there? He was still there, oh, yeah. I was in Franklin for three years. Um, and there was another violent offence, a yeah, violent one last scene with one of the biggest kids that come on the wing. He was called uh, Sharpie. He was doing a 25-year tariff for killing a copper with his fucking bare hands. His dad's here, uh, Paul Sykes. He's well known. His dad was Sykes. His dad Sykes. And that Sharpie, he's, he had a tattoo on his arm saying, Sharp by name, Sykes by nature. So this is Sykes' son? This is Sykes' son, I. I don't know this story, but we've like published the audio books about Paul Sykes and everything. If you have a look on here, um, there's a YouTube video of him in Strange Ways. No, I think it's Strange Ways doing it. There's a documentary on him. Does he look like him? No, he's like fucking massive. This He's fucking, he's about six foot. Maybe he's, no, he's a bit shorter, but he's stuck <coughs> out. He was 23 storm when he's come on the wing. So he's stuck here. Yeah. Like, he was yeah. only 23. But he's booling around the wing like that. Um, and one of, one of the lads that was on the wing, he says, yeah, I can't die the fucking nutcase, this one. He got moved from Whitemore, I think it was. No, he got moved from one of the other dispersals. He's had trouble with the Muslims. And this one Muslim lad, he had a bit of a gammy arm. And he, um, he'd done something to Sharpies, but Sharpies followed him in the showers and sat on his good arm on top of him like that and just carved his face to bits. Oh. And then he fucking, that's why he got moved up to Franklin. So he's landed on the wing and he's fucking, but he's on the drugs, taking the smack and that, and he's going around and he's fucking robbing people. But in them places, you kind of can't wrong robbing the fucking dealers because they're fucking, where well, the big fucking naughty bastards, aren't they? So uh, he'd done it to the wrong person and fucking some little cockney lad got full of smack this deer and he's fucking got a coffee jar broken coffee jar full of chilli powder and Sharpie's talking to someone at the door fucking like that and the kids went up behind him rammed it in his neck twisted it and all the chilli powders went in and he's fucking legged it down the corridor seen all this happening he's ran down the corridor and Sharpie's just went like that fucking and he's booled down the corridor chasing after him and they, uh, he ran in the fucking mop cupboard the lad and locked the cupboard and the fucking screws went and stood in front of it so he couldn't get in and he was getting marched off the wing, and everyone stand on the railings, he's fucking boom, he's clapping and all that, and fucking off the wing. This kind of <laughs> mm. wow, that's a kind of story, isn't it? Wow. Crazy, yeah. I, holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> Any more from that? <laughs> there was another one I seen fucking there. Oh, uh, <laughs> I love these stories. <laughs> <laughs> this was when I was on the walkway coming back from work. One of the lads says, "Watch what's going to happen here," but in Franklin. I don't know where they're getting them, but lads were getting like metal spikes about that long. It's about as th thick as that. Um, and someone was sharpening them up down the wood shop. So lads were walking around with big spikes like that. And they were saying, watch what's going to happen here. And the kid's just jogging past us if he's jogging back to the wing. And he's just went like, oh, bang, stuck it in his fucking neck. Oh. All the way in, just pulled it out and just carried on jogging. What? And the fucking blood squirting oh. out his neck. Oh, you witnessed this I was just walking up behind them watching it I was saying oh, what did you think? Hell. yeah were you not shocked I wasn't bothered <laughs> <laughs> do you know what that beef was over he owed money for drugs he didn't mm. pay his debts the biggest one isn't it but in there obviously if you get into debt you've got to fucking pay it or you're fucked you know what I mean because there's any the next man will take a tenner bag just to fucking do him in yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> did, did the uh, you get involved in gambling or anything no, I didn't get involved with it. They, um, obviously, the lads that I was having it with were doing bits and we had a big food bag full of air. Uh, obviously, we were getting paid in meat. 
So I had like steaks, pork chops, chickens, <laughs> food big is bag king. full of meat. <laughs> yeah, food, food is uh, cash and Was prison, anyone visiting you? Yeah, my family was coming in, my mum, my sister, my, my brother. Had a few of my friends coming in. But also in Franklin at the time, um, there was a lot of drinking, now the hooch. It got to the point where I fucking, I was coming back from the gym and I was knocking it back. I was saying I didn't want any of the night. <laughs> <laughs> but hooch in there was absolutely fucking lethal. Um, Does it give you the shit? Sometimes I. <laughs> give me the shit <laughs> when I tried it. <laughs> yeah. But it was this Irish lad that was there. Yeah. He used to brew it for us and he used to make it absolutely lethal. You would have one cup full and you were fucking pissed. What? But it used to turn a lot of people fucking violent. I've seen people flip out and smashing the pads up and everything. But yeah, like I say, I got to the point where I was fucking having to refuse it. Because I was into my fitness and my training at the time, I was concentrating on that. And coming back and I was having a drink. And then two nights later, the same my mates were still having a drink. And I was like, no, nah, <laughs> not the night. <laughs> was it expensive? Yeah, um, not really, because you just fucking, you do what you sell, or you just pay someone to keep a hold of it. What did it taste like? Actually, if it was done properly and it was chilled afterwards, it didn't taste too bad. Is it like a cider texture? A bit like cider, I. Yeah. Oh, yeah, more orange 2020, if you taste that. Yeah, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like that, I. <laughs> what, what was the recipe they used for it? Um, Just pure orange juice, sugar, and brown bread. But if they didn't have brown bread, or, or if you could get yeast from the kitchens, the yeast worked better. But all you had to do after you've made the one, the stuff in the bottom, we used to call it the kicker, the kickstart. We used to keep that and use the same one over and over. But uh, Robbie, the lad who'd done it because the screws used to come in, search your pads for the five litre tubs. You had five litre tubs, uh, detergent tubs. We used to pour all the detergent out, wash it out and use them to cook their uh, hooch in. But obviously, they got onto that, so we're just using litre bottles. And Robbie used to squash them and put them behind his cabinet. But this day, he got tucked down the block. Um, and you're supposed to let the fizz out every night. And he was down the block for a few days. Everyone's out on association. And all you heard was fucking bang, bang, pop, pop. His fucking cell was smashing into pieces. Oof. Screws were thinking, fucking hell's the eye <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So... Any other crazy stuff happened before you got to, moved? Yes. <clears throat> party that we had at uh, Christmas. Oh. Don't know if you, you'll, you'll have heard of Kevlian. Oh, yeah, we've interviewed him. Have you interviewed Ready him? Man, yeah, yeah. Well, he we used, we used to have a drink with uh, Kev. Kev was a funny bloke, charismatic. He used, to, uh, he used to get done up, have his fucking pants on and his shirt and all that, bit after shave and all that. <laughs> and he used to come out for a drink. We were on this pod this one day, um, it was Christmas day, the lads were getting MDMA, coke, skunk, everyone had a little bit of stomach, <laughs> so we are all sharing that around, we are all off with fucking heads in the pods, had the music on, it was a bucket of hooch in the middle of the pod, <laughs> and this screw that was walking around doing the checks, he was from the non-swings, and he wasn't normally on our wing, so he popped his head in, he says, what the fuck's going on in here? And the lads were like, see, and he said, fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> he says fucking leave us be so he's went to get the rest of the screws and they've walked down and they uh, said to the screws I'll pop my head out he says have you seen what these are doing down here the screw says listen just fucking let them be they're not causing any trouble <laughs> it's Christmas day we want to go home if they kick off we're going to be stuck here just let them so obviously bang up time came we just went behind the doors and all that but fucking that was a funny old uh, funny old session that <laughs> like I say because I was young at the time as well I remember ringing my mates back home saying I'm had the, I've had the best Christmas ever and all. <laughs> 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 obviously fucking I was young and daft and I didn't have didn't really have much apart from my mother and I would say so how many um, Christmases had you been in there for at this point I, I was I think I might have been my second Christmas but I'd spent five in all together wow so why did they move you? I'd been in there after about three years and I uh, had to do a um, drug and alcohol course yeah, as part of my sentence plan. Mm. So I'd done the drug and alcohol course. It was a six month course. And I'd, on the course, you had to open up and talk about past experiences and all that. And actually, after doing that course, 
my anxiety and everything started easing off and I started feeling a lot better because I'd opened up in the group and spoke about things. Oh, wow. Mm. And there was other lads in there who'd been in for murder and stuff, tough and lads, breaking down on the course, talking about their experiences when they were kids and stuff. Obviously, there's always a reason why people end up in prison and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they, uh, everyone started feeling better after that course and that's when I fucking started seeing things in a different light and looking to the future. And I actually stopped drinking. I didn't take any drugs after that when I was in Franklin. And I sorted myself out and I started... Because when I was drinking, I was still fucking feeling violent and stuff. I was going back to my pad and I was fucking having these crazy thoughts about doing people in on the wing, people that I didn't really like. And then the next day when I woke up, I was saying, fucking hell, what was I thinking? And then I started evaluating what I was doing. Started thinking about what I wanted for the future and that's when I started... Sort me head out, and, I, and then I got downgraded at Category C. Why didn't you like those people? The one particular lad, he was in for killing an old man. Killed an old man, and he put him behind the settee, and he was actually living in the man's house, and cashing his gyro in and that. So, when I found out the story, we were out on the yard, walking around the yard, and I was pissed up. And I was like, going crazy, I see his next lap, I see as he's getting it. And my mates were like, see him, fucking hell, calm down, what's the matter with you? Obviously, they're all over them. I mean, I'm like a young, hot-headed man. See, I'm going to fucking kill him. And they say, what the fuck? Calm yourself down, man. You're IPP. You're never going to get out of you do that. So, obviously, I calm myself down and all that. And that's when I started thinking about my actions and what. If I don't book my ideas, well, I'm never getting out. So, I got downgraded at Category C. <clears throat> and I got moved back up to Northumberland, which was Acklinton. Castleton and Acklinton's actually merged into one prison now, and it's all one big prison. So I'd done like a full circle and landed back up there. And uh, I was coming up to me four year mark and I was thinking to myself, I could be getting out here, you know? So I started looking to what I wanted for the future. And uh, my girlfriend who I'd been with on and off from about 18 had stuck by us. Um, and I knew when I got out, I wanted to be with her and I wanted to have kids. And this was all the things in my head and said a line fantasizing about prison fantasizing about violence i'm now fantasizing about me freedom about being out there living life i wanted to get out there and start a business up because yeah my granddad had died whilst i was in there and i had a bit of inheritance so i thought this money i want to put a good use when i get out and I, um how old are you at this point of the story 25 i mean how did you make a relationship work while in prison it didn't, it wasn't really a proper relationship because when she was coming into visitors, she visited us the whole time, but I said to her, I wrote her a letter from Franklin when I thought I was going to be in for years and years, and I just said, listen, you're a young lass, you just do what you want out there. I said, like, I'm stuck in here, didn't put your life on hold for me. She obviously, like, took it the wrong way and she was gutted, it, but she still stuck by us. And it was a year before I was getting released. Uh, sorry, a year before I got out. I wrote her a letter telling her that I loved her. I wanted to be with her, wanted to have kids. And then in the morning, I was thinking, fuck, should I post it or not? Should I post it? I was thinking, oh shit, what have I done? <laughs> so I posted it. I got a letter back a few days later. Fucking, she felt exactly the same. She's coming up on visits and it was like, love's young dream. Fucking, I was Bet a total different person. <laughs> hi. Uh, yeah. hi. Were you able to have a kiss at these visits? I would have a kiss not at the end. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I got out after serving five years, and she was out there waiting for us at the gates. Um, so going back to Elkington, how was that different from Franklin? It was like being back to Cassington. It was just full of fucking idiots. Oh. Like, there's 120 on the wing, and you might get about a handful of decent lads, and the rest of them's just fucking little junkies, idiots, little burglars. Like, Franklin, you've got, like, big-time criminals and, like, they're all decent lads, even though they're in for fucking mad stuff. Like, the good people, you can get on with them. There's no chow, no ricks. Then you get up there and you're back amongst all the idiots again. Do you feel like you're downgraded? I was, like, getting downgraded, but obviously it was me and another lad went from there, from Franklin. He's a big lad. There was two big lads. Everyone's like, fucking hell, you's from Franklin. Like, and everyone's, like, looking up here and all that. <laughs> it was I but obviously at that time I just wanted to keep my head down and get on with it did get into a couple of little altercations over what? 
I can't even remember fucking particularly what it was over. It was just over nothing. Like people wanting to fucking like half try and fuck on. But when you turn around in them places and you just put it on them and say, we're holding nine times out of 10, they just say, oh, fucking hell, I'm only joking. You know what I mean? Did you hear of any horrible experiences from other prisoners? From up there? Yeah. Um, up there, there was obviously there was fights all the time and up, but it wasn't as bad as what it was in Franklin. Yeah. Yeah. There was bits of fights. There was the odd people getting person getting slashed, but it was very. Was there many suicides? There was um, in the time that I'd been in. I was I think there was about three that I'd on the wings that I'd been on. Yeah, and where lads that took their own lives, not hanging, hung themselves out. Mm. Just depressed, though. Just depressed, are oh, yeah. In Franklin, you would have thought people that were doing the biggest sentences, there would be more in there, but there wasn't. I didn't, there was none when I was in there. No. But that there, you would expect it from them people, you know what I mean? Like doing sentences like that. So how did you pass the end of your sentence? I'd actually done a load of courses when I was up there. I'd done business courses. I'd done, everything I was doing was to like better myself. You've yeah. completely reversed, haven't you? I did, I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a total different head on us. I was like, I want to get out there. I want to make something of myself. And that's what I'd done. As soon as I got out, I moved in with my uh, girlfriend, who was now my wife. And yeah, uh, got her pregnant the first year. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> she hates it when I see her that. <laughs> <laughs> Very but, um, soon after. Aye, uh, straight away, <laughs> obviously. All the healthy living. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I bought I bought a burger van on a plot up in Stanley. Um, it was on a car park, the burger van, but I knew they were building a big academy on that plot. So I paid a little bit extra just to get this burger van. Um, and when they started building this school, I had a sat, sit down meeting with the director of the site. And he actually put us a big porter cabinet on the site and let me put a kitchen inside of it for the workers. So I'd done that for about two or three years. But in the meantime, I set up a car valet in business. Um, and then my wife had another kid. We had a little daughter. So we had a lad and a lass. Um, and then once that school was built, I went and bought a coffee on an industrial estate. Like I say, I was grafting from the day I got out just to make me This is baffling. You you went in at such a young age and you come up with such a business brain. <laughs> like I'm entrepreneurial shit. Working so hard. Yeah. You worked your ass off, didn't you? I did, I like, like, Most people, not most people, but there is a majority of people who come out of prison and they get stuck in the system, go back in. But you seem to have gone <laughs> the polar opposite. Uh, because what drove because of the, when I used to look up to the certain people, yeah, um, I think when I was in Franklin as well, it wasn't just that, but some of the lads that were in there, were like millionaires had done well for themselves and all that, even though they were in for different certain things. And I thought, I want to be successful. I want to do that, you know what I mean? So uh, obviously, I just put my mind to it, got out, and I made... I wanted that money to work because I looked at my brother and sister who got the same amount of money and they'd done what I would have done if I hadn't been to prison and they just fucking drank it away. <laughs> it was gone within a year. God. Yeah, um, and I thought, I'm not going to do the same. I'm not going to make the same mistake. So uh, I made it work for us. So you had to do your, what was it, your burger van? Car valeting. Car valeting. Then I got a coffee on an industrial estate. Wow. It's impressive it's at 20, in your 20s as well. <laughs> yeah, how old were you? 25? 25 when I started all out. Wow. So and, uh, kept you busy. And um, then the, after a while, the car valeting died off a bit because they opened up all these car washes and now the drive through ones. So it died off a little bit and the coffee... Wasn't doing so good, so I sell the coffee, sell the car wallet and business. Um, and I put my money into motor trading, bought myself a recovery truck, and I was going backwards and forwards to auctions. And again, it was another thing, I put my mind to it, and everything I put my mind to, like, we, I wasn't getting much apart from my wife. People were looking at us like family and that, I wasn't getting much back up thinking, they were saying, What are you doing? Like, you didn't really know much about cars. My wife was the only one that, like, fully backed us. And then I was selling 10 cars a week. Wow. Just bringing them backwards and forwards from the auctions outside <laughs> my door, just putting a few hundred quid on each car and just selling fucking out of 10 cars a week and that, just fucking flying, loving it. <laughs> <laughs> this is inspirational. Isn't it? Yeah, it makes me feel lazy. <laughs> but in amongst all this, started here, 
experiencing deaths in the family and different yeah. things. And then this started altering me way of thinking that again. Because um, you're busy in, with in business what, and your wife took a knock, didn't she? It was me, the first one, it was my wife's grandma. Um, my wife, my mother-in-law rang us up and said, I need you to take us up. My mum's, something's happened. So I have went and picked her up and I've took her up. I went to open the door and her mum was lying behind the door. She was dead. Um, and they, uh, they took her to the hospital. Obviously they revived her and they kept her alive for a week after that. She'd had a heart attack. But that was the first death that I'd uh, experienced. And I went home and I remember lying in bed with my wife cuddling her and fucking I'm sobbing like a big baby. I'm crying more than her. Mm. It was like all the years of everything just built up inside of us that I never let out started coming out. And I was thinking, fucking hell. Like it really affected his body, you know what I mean? And then uh, a year later, on the same day, my, my nana died. She'd been dying with their cancer. She had a... Um, bowel cancer and she was in hospital and she said to us because I was really close to me nana and she said to us she goes Ricky she says I want to die at home please don't let us die in a hospice or anything like that so I said her looking at her if that's what you want that's what you're getting I'm taking you home so I took her home and I looked after her yeah she let just in the bedroom she had like a hospital bed and every day I was looking after the nurses and that were coming in giving her morphine and that. And she went on for about two or three weeks without any food, just fading away. And I was sleeping there on a night time, but my wife was my wife was pregnant at the time. So I was having to try and be with my wife and be with my nana. And uh, I used to wake up on a morning walk in the bedroom and fucking, I was praying to God. I mean, I'm not a God believer and stuff like that, but I was lying there praying, saying, I hope she's gone. Walked in and she's still alive. <laughs> Looking up at us, <laughs> I think, Aww. fucking hell. But yeah, my wife rang us up. I'm going into the labour. He needed to take us to the hospital. So uh, I've had to leave my nana. Took my wife into the hospital the night before. <clears throat> in half ten in the morning, my daughter was born. And that, I think this is what my nana was hanging on to. Because uh, my brother rang us up after my daughter was being born. He says, Ricky, you need to get to the hospice. And they put my nana in the hospice when I wasn't there. And they said, um... You need to get here quick, she's fucking, she hasn't got long left. So I flew to the hospice, went in the room, tell everyone to get out. And I've grabbed her hand and I said, Nana, she says, yeah, Michaela's had the baby, she's fine, she's here, everything's fine. And I said, um, you can go now. And she just went, <gasps> took her breath in my hands like that and I just felt her soul just wow. leave. She died in my hands. Holy shit. And I was That's like, fucking, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, look. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm getting them talking about it now. Wow. Oh my she God. Just, I think the spirit of us is in the right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd see my daughter born in the morning and then my nana died that same day. And it was relief you felt when she died. It, it was, right, I, was, right time, it was it? relief. Yeah. Because she was suffering, I wanted her to go. It wasn't like a sudden thing where like, you know, so I didn't really, although I was good at it, it didn't affect us in a bad way where I was like, fucked up over, over it because I wanted her to go um, and then a year later everything like February was like a fucking bad month a year later my best friend the one who stuck by us through my prison sentence used to come and visit us friends from the age of 11 we've done everything together smoked dope and all that and fucking drinking went through school he was suffering he, um, silently no one knew and suffering with his mental health and he'd been messaging us this day all day, like, in a bad way. And I said to him, I said, listen, I said, I'll come up later. So uh, I've tried to ring him, and he didn't answer. So I've went and got my friend, my other best friend, and we flew up to his flat, went and got his brother. And we're banging on the fucking door, and there was no answer. It was an upstairs flat. And I fucking, as I'm banging on the door, I hear the keys on the other side, so I knew he was in the flat. And I've just panicked. I said, stand back and we're fucking. I've just booted the door as hard as I could. Doors flung open. And we went running upstairs. Went in every room looking for him. Couldn't find him. Then I looked at this one door, the bedroom door. And I've started pushing the door. And he was hanging on the back of the door. Oh. <sighs> Pushed the door open. Um, I was screaming for my friend, get the scissors. Fucking. And I've cut the noose off his neck. And tried to bring him back. And he was just gone. Jesus. Like the sound I... Never forget it when I was pressing on his lungs. It felt like a 
was like a hot water bottle with a hole in it, just squelching. I'm giving a mouth to mouth for you, just the other two mates had run out of the room. So I'm in the room by myself, and then I was screaming at my other mate, and I said, you need to get in here now. So he came in, he took over, he, um, obviously he was gone, and fucking that, like, fucking totally oh, man, fucked no. us up after that. Yeah, how was the aftermath after that? I just started fucking, me and my mate, the one who found them, both of us were fucking just drinking heavily, drinking bottles of vodka and that, up all night, fucking crying at each other, and just heads totally gone. Um, but then, I think it was a year or two later, my wife's auntie, who she was really close to, done the exact same thing. She no. killed herself, hung herself. And then it's just sent us even worse. Fucking heads were totally mashed up. And then a year after that, me other best mate, who looked up to us, um, we'd done a lot together and all that. It was really good, close pal. He'd done the same thing. I think he was only 25, fucking hung himself on a fence post in the back street, six o'clock in the morning. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, and just obviously... Go on. At the time, it just fucking sent us even worse. Just I was going to say, what? Well, how was your fucking mental health at this point? I was just drinking all the time and just fucking head was so, fucked. So were your businesses suffering then as well during the deaths? Yeah, I, I wasn't selling as many cars. I was still going down the auctions. Obviously, I had to make money still for the family and that. And, but it was... I was just going through life just fucking in a negative way. Everything was just like... I was like, didn't give a fuck again. Even though I had kids... It was like, my wife said she used to look at us and I'd just be sitting staring at the wall and she said she just fucking felt so sorry for us, you know, like looking at us like that. But yeah. I mean, those five deaths, what were they a period of? So just a couple of years? It all happened within like, I think it was three, three years, three, four oh, years. too much, isn't it? Yeah, it's not. And then uh, I'd been out of prison 10 years and I got recalled after uh, 10 years. Well, it was nine and a half year. I'd been out. Yeah, um, I was sitting in the house one night drinking. And I got a phone call through Facebook Messenger asking if I wanted to buy a stolen motor. It's like a stolen car. It was a brand new car. Obviously, I didn't think twice. I thought fucking someone down the auctions has asked us if I'd ever done out like that. So I knew someone I could sell it to. So being a bit pissed, I just thought, oh, fuck it. Bought the car and I was going to drop it off over this way, over Newcastle. And uh, I'd get in a blowout on the motorway and the fucking tyre was flat. And I just kept, obviously I couldn't stop. I was on the motor, I was in a pinched car. So I've just kept driving and I've pulled off the motorway and I was going up a back street and I seen fucking blue flashing lights. Oh. So I just thought, shit, but they weren't even coming for me, but I put my foot down up this back street. And because I've been driving so long with a fucking flat tyre, put my foot on the brakes, it didn't work. <sighs> I've just smashed into the back of a car doing about 50. The car's shunted into a house, fucking pushed the car, the house wall in. What? I've jumped out of the car, fucking airbags went off, and I've just took off, ran away, left the car, and uh, I thought I'd get away with it, because fucking the months had started going by. Then six months later, I'd actually sorted my head out and all that. Luckily, I did before I got recalled. Sorted my head out, back in the gym, and that I was off the drink, and I was in my recovery truck, and the copper car went past us, but it was like two women busies. And I was thinking, something's not right here. But then they started coming after us, and then another one. And then the fucking, it was about 10 copper cars behind us, flashing lights, fucking all boxed us in. Come and said, right, can you get in? Can you jump out, please? And I says, what for? What's the matter? And he says, can you just get out, please, and get in the back of the car? They wouldn't tell us until they had us in the car. And the reason why there was that many police cars is because of me violent past. They couldn't, like, pull you with one copper. So they put us in the back of the car and they said, oh, you wanted for recall to prison? And me fucking whole life just fell apart. I thought, oh, fucking hell. Everything I've built up over the years and all that. F wife, four kids, because I got married in that time. And then, yeah, uh, I'm on my way back to Durham. But at the time, I'd, I said, what, what am I wanted for? Because did they have any evidence? They had me fucking, um, my saliva was on the airbag. Oh. But at the time, the cop was in the area. They didn't like us because they seen what I was doing. I had the scene that I was doing good for myself. I was driving around in a big car, big Discovery 4. And I could see the way they used to pull up outside my house sometimes and fucking sit and stare at my house. Obviously, they're looking at us thinking, what's he fucking doing? How's he come out of prison and he's got all this? But they had down that. They, um, I found out in my dossier, they had a, uh, there was police intelligence that I was supplying drugs in the area. And this is what 
the police had said, or people have been saying to the police, because I'm doing well for myself, people's looking and saying, oh, he's driving big cars, he's he's doing this, he's fucking, how's he done that? But people didn't know that I had inheritance and I'd built, built it up. <clears throat> so the coppers wanted us off the street, so when they found out about this DNA and the airbag, they've rang me probation and said, listen, you need to recall him. My probation officer at the time didn't like us either, didn't get on with her, and she... The wanted has gone off the street, so the fucking the recall is back to prison. So I'm stuck in prison. Hadn't even been charged with anything. It was just because my saliva was on the airbag. So how, how did that feel the moment you heard you getting recalled? It was just like totally deflated. I was just like fucking mm. like I'd been popped with a pin and just fucking. Because the last oh. time you were excited about going in, now no, you've I, got your family, your kids, your business. Later. Totally different. Yeah, though. different. The lunch first time all. I wanted to go to prison this time. I didn't want to go, and I knew with my sentence that I'm going to be finding a fucking fight to get back out with IPP. I'm back in there serving that 99-year sentence. So realistically, if I didn't behave myself while I was in prison, I could have still been in there now. Mm. And how hard was that, the temptation? And- when I was back in there, I was in Durham, obviously, a lot of people knew I was in there and all that. I didn't get any fucking trouble with anyone. I was the biggest, one of the biggest lads in there, so people's not going to mess with you when you're that big, you know what I mean? To see them with the screws, the screws give a lot of people, they give the lads a hard time, especially the smaller lads. And then someone like myself, like the fucking, oh, do you want a job on the cleaners? You know what I mean? The fucking up your ass. But I'm back in there and I'm just, I'm still in this negative mindset because I hadn't dealt with all these emotions, all these deaths that had happened to us. I was still blaming people, blaming the fucking probation, blaming the police. Instead of like, it took us six months to own up to myself and take responsibility. And it was that moment that I fucking totally changed again. I was back to that person with a positive outlook. Even though I was in that position and we got locked down with COVID and there was no court cases. So I was saying to me, solicitors, so what's going to happen here? And this is where you're not going to get out until you go to trial but there's no trials we're on lockdown I thought the charge that I was actually in for as well was aggravated vehicle taking I was charged with pinching the car and because I crashed it it was called aggravated vehicle taking which sounds like a bad charge you know what I mean Um, it's not something you really want on your record obviously I would have admitted to buying the car but I had to actually plead guilty to the charge just to move on and I got an eight-month sentence for that. Um, and I actually served 30 months back on a recall. And it was 23-hour lockdown every day. So you say you were feeling particularly negative when you went in, and then six months later you started to feel positive again. Yeah, it wasn't like I say, when I... Because I was blaming that probation officer saying there was no need for her to fucking recall me like this. And I was blaming the police. And then it wasn't until I took a look at myself and thought, the only reason I'm in here is because of what I've done. It's my actions. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't be here. And I fucking took it all, took responsibility for everything. Tell my wife and kids how sorry I was. Because obviously I was speaking to them every day. And that was the hardest part. Me two-year-old and me three-year-old saying to us, uh, when are you coming home, Dad? But I didn't have a release date. So every day I couldn't tell them. And that just fucking broke us. It would break any man who loved the kids, you know what I mean? And how did yeah. your wife feel about this? My wife's, like she's done all the time, she's stuck by us and she's, she felt sorry for us, you know what I mean? Because of what I was going through. And <clears throat> because we're on lockdown, I didn't see them for six months. I didn't see my youngest son for a 10 months because I couldn't get him on the visit. How intense was that then, lockdown, during the virus? It was intense as fuck, like... Especially when, at the time, COVID landed on our wing in the March. I think everyone got locked down in March. And one of the screws had brought it in. And everyone got it on the wing. But you're watching this on the telly about people dying and you're thinking, fuck this, is it? I'm fucked. You, you can't get out of your room. And then when I seen it come up about losing your sense of smell and your taste, sitting on the toilet on the morning, I thought, fuck, I can't <laughs> smell out. I've got it. <laughs> I fucking, my chest was caving in. I'm lying there. And it was, I didn't want to tell my wife, so I didn't want her to worry. 
It was five days later. The lad that I was on the survey with, he was uh, He got up the day before me, and everything that was happening to him was happening to me a day later. And he got put in a coma, took off the wing and all that, and I thought, oh, fucking hell. I told my wife on the phone, I said, I've got COVID. And uh, luckily, I got over it. Oh, my God. But that feeling in that cell by yourself thinking, this is it, dying here lonely. Did they try, try and give you any treatment or come and speak to you about it, the medical staff? But this is the worst thing about it as well. You had to suffer in silence because the lads that, some of them were fucking screaming at the door, crying, fucking, I've got the nurse, I can't breathe. So they'd come in the suits, take you off the wing, put you on the isolation wing and leave you locked up for fucking, I think it was, at the time it was 21 days behind your door what they used to do, just chuck you in the pod. And they used to open the door and push a fucking broomstick and with your food on, tell them to get to the back of the pod. You had no shower, wouldn't allow to take a shower for three weeks. No way. And they'd give you a pad away on the wing, so you're settled with all your friends on the wing. And they're saying, oh, it's okay, we'll keep yourself for you. As soon as you've gone, they fucking fumigate the pod and give it to someone else. What? So you're losing your cell, you're not getting a shower, you're not allowed contact with anyone. So everyone was just suffering in silence, not telling anybody and spreading it even more. So they weren't testing? Oh, they were testing people, but that's what they would do. They would put you on there first, then test you and leave you there for three weeks. So you could get away with having it and not. <laughs> <laughs> if, you le- if you left your pad then, what happened to your property? It would all get chucked away. <laughs> because of like, So you're losing all your stuff. You're losing oh your pad. And everyone was just like... So this lad who I'm on about who got put in the coma... He didn't want to see anything. And we said to him at the end, I said, listen, mate, I says, you need to tell them. Because he was overweight. He was just, on the outside, he was a heavy drug user, smackhead and crackhead. Um, and he didn't realise at the time he had underlying health issues. He had diabetes and that's what he got put in a coma for. He was in a coma for three months. Luckily, he came back from it. Yeah. So were you in lockdown for the 13 months, the entire 13 months? For about 10 months of it. Wow. Lockdown. Were the guards dressed in spacesuits and stuff? The medical screw uh, staff were when they used to come on the wing to test people, but the screws, you wouldn't believe it. The office was tiny. They're supposed to stay outside the office. No, con- what's it called? They're self distancing, I mean. Self isolation. Uh, social distancing. Social, social distancing, distancing now. Yeah. You used to, look, when you did get opened up for your dinner, you'd look down in the office, and there's 10 of them just huddled in the room together. <laughs> you're thinking, <laughs> And they're screaming at us, seeing space out when you're walking down. Everyone's saying, are you having a fucking love? There's 10 of you in the office and you're screaming at us to keep apart. Was everyone not <laughs> angry that the guards were bringing it in anyway? Aye, but the guards were looking at us like it was our fault. <laughs> <laughs> you had no visits, but yeah, obviously. No visits and out, I um, And obviously, there was nothing happening. There was no courses going on. I'm thinking I'm going to be stuck here for years. And instead of sitting dwelling... And making a, just being in a bad situation, I turned that negative into a positive. Um, I was out on the yard every day. You got like an hour a day on the yard. And I just started doing bodyweight circuits. Got myself extremely fit because I went up and I was 19 stone. And I was eating all the wrong foods in prison. I ballooned up. Um, and I felt unfit. So I started doing bodyweight circuits on the yard. Went down to 16 and a half stone after like six months every day. And I was acting like the PT for the rest of the lads. I was getting them out. Some of them weren't coming out. They were depressed, wouldn't come out of the pad. I'm banging on the door saying, how I get yourself out? We'd go out on the yard and I was getting everyone, by a handful of us, extremely fit. And then I thought to myself, I need to start writing this down, jotting ideas. And I thought, I'm going to write a book. And I started writing, jotting ideas down. I was writing every day for six months. Um, and obviously that's where the book came from. Of course. Just the... Uh, Every day I wrote my story in the book. I wrote like the way I was cooking my food in prison because I was doing kettle curries. You get like a little travel kettle in prison mm. and we would, you put a little bit of butter in, fry your onions, peppers, tin of tomatoes, put your spices in, <laughs> tin of tuna um, and put that in with your rice. Have a ch- uh, tuna curry. Master <laughs> chef. But it was uh, healthy food, you know what I mean? <laughs> Is this in the book? It's in the book. I've got loads of recipes in there and I've got how to make them and everything. So you've got all the proper stretches. I've got how to demonstrate every body weight exercise, every bodybuilding exercise. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> tuna couscous. <laughs> <laughs> so you've gone through all the deaths then. 
you're in prison during the pandemic, which is really intense. Yeah. But do you credit the pressure the, the, on, on your mind then of putting you in a position where you were, you were going to be turning around from the low again? Yeah, like I turned it around. What I did say to myself, it was my friends, my first friends, death that fucked us up the most. I was talking to him in my head and I said to him, I said like, you fucked my life up long enough, like, because of what you've done. And I now need to fucking sort myself out and like, stop letting this affect me. I wasn't blaming him, but I was saying like, you fucking, you fucked my head up and I need to fucking get out of this. And so, as I'm writing the book every day, like I'm speaking to me mate in my head and I felt like he was fucking guiding us along. And in the back of the book, I've dedicated the book to them. Um, I've got a dedication page. Um, and I've actually done the book for them and done it for people suffering with mental health because I wanted to, because I was in that better frame of mind and I was helping people in prison, I wanted to help even more people. I wanted to reach out. And they... Um, as I was writing the book, I thought this book's not just for prisoners, it's for people at home feeling like prisoners trapped in their own thoughts. So the book is for people anywhere, in any situation, how to better yourself. Yeah. And it talks about mental health That's and how to overcome important. it through exercise. Mm. So important. So you became a man on a mission. Oh, I definitely. Gave you the focus <laughs> and then and the time started to go. It started going by quicker and um, I knew... When I come up for parole, I had the same thing again with friends and staff and all that saying, oh, you'll not get your first one. And But I was like determined in my head. I thought, well, I'm not in for violence. I've been out there for 10 years. I got, I got my IPP because of violence and I haven't committed any violence. I know it was a car offence, but fucking hell, you can't keep us in forever for this, you know what I mean? So I went up on the parole board and I had to sit and fight for my life and tell them and how all about that? myself. How easy was that? Oh, it wasn't easy. I know, it was I'm on that. <laughs> I'm just looking at you. Look and after. so different. Yeah. We're looking at like a negative face, isn't it? Like look yeah. evil. <laughs> yeah, you're so happy and smiley now. <laughs> yeah, you do look like a scary motherfucker. I've learned to turn things wrong. I think like if you deal with situations and don't let it fuck you up, you can enjoy your life and have a good outlook. So in America then, this is loss of a you know friend or something. Is it the same in the UK? It means uh, it's either like you've done a life sentence or killed someone or a loss of a friend, but it was like sort of all these tattoos that I got, I got when I was getting off my head, when I was pissed. And the, they all tell a different story and it was all, at the time I didn't realise what my wife was saying was, you're fucking self-harming. Every time I was pissed and I was in a depressive mood, I was getting tattoos. I mean, why did you get the teardrop? Because it's usually if someone dies by being killed by someone, oh, by a gang just, member. Because I got it when I was pissed, UK's, I was getting. UK's different from US. Ah, yeah. I'm on US. I got terms. it when I was pissed, and I was in that frame of mind again. I was like, it means like you've done a life sentence, or like you say you've lost someone, and fucking. Yeah. In America, <laughs> it's, it's obviously gang member. If you have one that isn't filled in, uh, someone's killed your member, and yeah. then once you kill the member, you fill it in. That's what I'm aware of. <laughs> Not too familiar. But you've got some really, really cool ones on your arm. Like arms. So you've got like oh, Day God. of the Dead sort of style. <laughs> Are you really into that? The what, sorry? Day of the Dead. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Like death, life and death tattoos. Like it's yeah. that one says life is a game. At the time it was like fucking gambling, dice and my death and... The way I was living my life again. It's wicked. Did anyone, did anyone try and sabotage your workout program and your book writing in prison? You know, you get Some people get pissed off because you, you're successful. Or the guards, did they try and sabotage anything? No, they didn't. Not the way I'm obviously, because of the way I was conducting myself and they were seeing that, I was like, I was helping people. And the lads that I was helping, I'll never forget them. Um, a lad from my end, he was in a really bad place in prison. He's not like you, you get people like you see in prison where you think like he's jail type and he's like not jail material. And he was like, you could just tell he just didn't look like the jail type and he, he wasn't really handling his jail well. Yeah, and I took him under my wing and I got him fit and all that and looked after him. And he said to us on me last day when I was leaving, shook me hand, he come in my cell. He said, You don't realize how much you've helped me. Oh, man. He says, I wouldn't have got through this without you. That's brilliant. <laughs> 
So what was it like leaving again? Oh, it was fucking unbelievable. Like, knowing that I was going back to fucking everything. Like, my family, my wife, my kids. Still had my car business, but I knew that was down the pan when I got out because I would have been, I was banned from driving. Insurance would have been fucked for driving recovery trucks. And that's when I just had this difference. See, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. I was business minded, thinking of how I can make more money or make a new business. And that book, um, and I started thinking about making my own clothing wear and different things. And I've ended up buying my own gym. And I've called the gym Ruthless Fitness, which is what it says on the book behind the bars, Ruthless Fitness. And that's in Newcastle? It's in Stanley, County Durham. County Durham. For me, this is all the same. (laughs) (laughs) It's not far from Newcastle. Yeah. When did you get released and how old were you? I got released um, January last year. So you've been out just a little over a year? Just over a year, aye. But as soon as I got out, the next day I was that determined. I was sitting up six o'clock in the morning with my laptop, <coughs> typing the book up. Um, just didn't stop at all until I got the book, like completed. You self-published it. Self-published it. I. It's on here. It's on Amazon. W. H. Smith. It's on Walmart. It's on a few sites in America. All wow. the link, all the links will be in the description box if you want to buy it as well. So, t- describe the day of your release. I got out. Yeah, I was standing behind the gate, waiting for it to open, getting emotional, waiting to see my wife and my best mate. The gate opened, popped my head through, <laughs> no one there. <laughs> fucking deflated, I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> so I walked over to the visitor centre. Yeah, obviously had no phone on out. So it's pissing it down with snow. And I've rang back, I've, I've managed to borrow a phone, rang my wife. And she's stuck on the A1 motorway in a traffic jam behind a lorry. Been stuck there for hours. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Oh. But it uh, took about another three hours and then they picked us up. Went back, but obviously it was in lockdown. So at the time, it was actually quite good because I was in that same routine mm. when I got home. Apart from I was going into my backyard to do a workout for an hour and then come back into the house with my wife and kids. <laughs> what was your first meal? Yeah, steak and chips. <laughs> <laughs> was that home cooked or did you have a favourite restaurant? Everything was shut. I was locked on. Oh, did you not have yeah. delivery? I lived off delivery. No, I'm not. I'm no. Not. <laughs> not <deliveries>. oh. <laughs> so were you busting out the exercise in the house at this point? In the yard when we best made um, it. Was in, like I see, I was lashing it down with snow. I bought some uh, weights off my friend along the street. And I was using my wooden bench in the backyard for doing bench pressing on. I remember putting a hundred k on just to see if I could still lift it. I banged thirteen reps out. <laughs> 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 I remember lying there doing the weights and the snow just bouncing off my face. <laughs> Refreshing. Still determined. Still there. Uh, trained every day. Went out for runs and nothing. Just carried on training. Trained ever since. Just kept in that mindset. Just kept positive. Have you had what's been your major challenges since you got out? Yeah. Just keeping myself right, keeping on the right path and just, like I see, I've, everything seems to have, because I've been on that positive mindset, everything's just seemed to have come to us and it's been like, it's just, everything's fell into place, you know, it's all come to us good. Because you made that decision to quit smoking, quit drinking, quit yeah. everything, how how easy is that to maintain? Yeah, um, I've had the odd couple of drinks, but when I do have a drink, my hangover's not too bad, but if for a few days afterwards, I fucking feel depressed. I feel agitated, and I just think, this isn't worth it. Mm-mm. So I, uh, I didn't have a drink for eight months, um, and then now I have the odd few drinks now, where I, now we can control it. Because mm-hmm. uh, that feeling that I was getting again, like anxious and anxiety, it just felt horrible. I thought, this isn't me. This like I like being clear-headed, waking up fresh, training. So that put you off it then? Value oh, sleep. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the goal? <clears throat> now what I'm doing at the minute, say I'm in my gym, I've set boxing classes up. I um, initially started them myself and then I've gotten my good friend in, Sean, uh, the boxing trainer. He does the classes now. Um, and I've just set a group up. Um, it's called, it's in a link with a book, it's called Behind the Bars Support Group. It's for men over the age of 18 year old. It's a free session. It's on once a week. 
um, and the lads can come in and they can use the gym afterwards for free. So the feedback I'm getting off that, I'm running the group myself with my friend, this way, the, the boxing coach, and we're sitting with about six lads and we're just sitting talking, they're opening up and making massive differences. On the, one of the lads had never left the house for three years, started coming to the gym, started using the gym. Um, another one of the lads, but there's two of them actually, they're in the gym every day now, never miss a day. How does that make you feel? Makes us feel great because they would have still been sitting at home if I didn't help them. And mm. But I think to myself, if I've got the power and the knowledge to do this and I've got the capacity, I've got somewhere to do it, why not do it? You know what I mean? Like, if there was more things around like this when I was younger, you might not have went down that path, you know what I mean? What inspired you to start the YouTube channel? I just started doing um, videos in my backyard at first. And then as it progressed... I'm doing like bit motivational talks and the feedback I'm getting off that as well, just off strangers. I've just got one before that I showed you, Sean. I am um, just seeing like how much this one video has changed his thoughts, changed his ways. He's actually going to watch this video every morning when he wakes up. Like someone's going to watch me speaking and they're getting power from that. But what created the idea to make those videos? The positivity that come to us because I changed my mindset and I knew how I could help change other people's mindsets and it's actually it is working but what made YouTube stand out as a tool to do that I don't know it just seemed to come to us to be honest I felt good by doing it and when I was getting the feedback like the feelings that I was get getting off helping people was better than any feelings that I used to get when I was hurting people so that's that's, uh, that's the reason I'm doing it and, and, and what kind of like, you know, over the last year or so then, as it's built up for you on YouTube, how's that impacted or changed your life? How do you mean? Like, like YouTube has took over my life. Yeah, and, all right. <laughs> how, how's it impacted oh, right, your now life? I get your eye. Yeah. Um, a few months back, I was putting them on every day as soon as I got to the gym, six o'clock in the morning, and I was it was becoming an obsession. Like, I was putting the video on, I was looking how many views I'd getting, how many subscribers I'm getting. <laughs> I'm just getting obsessed with it. And it fucking, <laughs> instead of promoting me boot and trying to sell me boot, I'm just getting stuck Ooh. into YouTube. <laughs> do, do you have a more balanced work life? I know, like I've uh, eased off a little bit. <laughs> so tell us about some of the people who've watched your YouTube and have reached out to you from around the world. There's people from all over, like you see around the world. Yeah, I've done a one with, like we see Josh off lockdown 23 and one. He actually got in touch with me, sent us a voice message. Yeah, um, said, I've seen you doing a workout on the treadmill. I was actually on the cross trainer. Mm-hmm. He says, I've seen you doing a video whilst you're on the cross trainer. He says, wow, man, <laughs> I need to get you on my show. <laughs> that was a bad American accent, that one. <laughs> he tried. Shout out to Josh. <laughs> but, um, and guys uh, in prisons have, have seen it as well. A they? lad from um, Australia in a detention centre got me books. Um, it's on my YouTube channel on the community page took a picture and he's um i follow him on instagram and i was watching his videos on instagram and i said to me last i said have a look at that in the background you can see my book on his shelf <laughs> and i thought <laughs> fucking hell makes you feel good <laughs> oh, it does I. And, you, and you film with paul stansby how, how was that i've done the one with paul stansby he's a cracking fella shout out to paul um, yeah lovely bloke I. how did that come about he got in touch with us as well he, um i think it was through instagram I'd seen him pop up and AC mine. We started following each other. Um, and it just started off with a brief message. And then within five minutes, we're on the phone to each other talking. And he says, I think what you're doing is what's good for my platform. It's like the message that I'm doing. So it's a similar sort of thing. Like what I'm trying to do for the youngsters, not as well, is giving them that option to get into fitness and get into boxing. Because the younger that you get into it and you get in that mindset, it's going to be a whole lot different to getting in the other mindset because it's hard to come back from. And I didn't have that when I was a kid. And I think just giving them that opportunity, it's like. So what message do you have out there for someone who wants to go to prison in their teens? As for someone that wants to go to prison that thinks it's big and clever, the advice I'll give you is don't do it. It's not worth it. When, as soon as you commit them offences, it fucks the rest of your life up. It interferes with everything. Like myself now, insurances, 
You've got to declare it for everything. Your car insurance, it affects you for fucking years and it's just not worth it. Try and get into something that you love. Get into a bit of fitness, bodybuilding. There's something out there that will give you a better thrill than getting off your head and going to prison because it's just not worth it. How easy was it to buy a gym? It, that seemed to just come to us as well. They, um, I bought some apparatus. I bought a pull-up machine off my friend in lockdown who owned a gym. And he said to us, I'm thinking about selling me gym. He says, and you're the perfect person for this gym and Stanley. So I don't want to just sell it to anyone. He says, he says you look, you're a bit like myself. He says, and I want you to carry the legacy on. So it took six months of making the decision because my head was fucked up over it. I was thinking I had to put every single thing I've got into it. Like I'll be skinned after I bought it. So I'm starting from scratch. And I thought if this doesn't work, like I'm fucked. So I put everything into it and it did actually what's well, doing good. Good. But once I made that decision, I felt good because I was having sleepless nights thinking about it, thinking, fucking hell, it's a big move this. But uh, it's the best decision I've ever made. My own kids are coming and my kids are looking up to me and that's what I'm doing it for as well. I don't want my kids looking up to me and thinking, my dad's been to prison, I want to go to prison. I don't want that, you know what I mean? Oh, that's so powerful, isn't it? From where you've been to where you are now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so inspirational as well. How is your father getting on? He's getting on all right. He's uh, obviously he's old now, he's 75, but he's he's not allowed in our area. He doesn't live there anymore. So, uh, But he's there, uh, he's all right. Good. Right then. Check this book out. And all of Ricky's links are in the description box below the video. Please go down and check his channel out. Subscribe. <laughs> He's going from strength to strength. His authenticity. How inspirational it is to just helping the young people. Just such positive energy. So, yes. Absolutely brilliant, man. No, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Thank you. Really good. Well done. Uh, would you like a hug? <laughs> <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press, who have published Northern Warrior by Richie Horsley, available worldwide on Amazon now. It's almost five stars across the board, and here's the blurb from the back cover. I've recently read Northern Warrior by Richie Horsley and it just blew me away. Given away as a six-day-old baby, Richie really began his life fighting. He was brought up by a loving couple in the fine northern seaside town of Hartlepool. But fighting became a way of life and he couldn't escape it as much as he tried. Growing up in a fighting town with passion for punk rock, a liking for boxing and a reputation for fighting, Richie would find himself in many situations with some infamous faces, such as prison icon Paul Sykes and Tyneside's Viv Graham and his big fight with the notorious prisoner Charles Bronson. Richie has lived his life with a strong moral code, impeccable manners and a gentlemanly attitude but of course, when you mix that with bouncing in clubs and being in prison, those are traits you can't always abide by, and using extreme violence was sometimes necessary, even if it meant having to dodge a bullet or two. Some of his fights have passed into local folklore due to the brutality of them. ABA boxer, unlicensed boxer, burn knuckle fighter, street fighter. Richie was all of these. Northern Warrior is the true story of a modern day gladiator. It hasn't always been an easy ride, but Richie has faced every challenge with a warrior's mentality. Richie's journey is far from over. He continues to live by his motto in life, which is, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Yeah, so check out Northern Warrior by Richie Horsley. Link is in the description box below this video. The audiobook is superb. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. 
whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution. Here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on Organic Cotton Clothing dot co dot uk